This episode of Spectre Sound Studios is brought to you by Magic Spoon. Your take on the desktop metal being related to the situation of young people is on point. More than half of my salary is going on rent, and I'm splitting it with my girlfriend either way. These are just horrible times to live in. Unless your parents are rich or you're a landlord, then it's the opposite. I feel this is the situation for many people out there that they can barely afford rent, much less afford instruments or start a band or anything like that. But don't despair about it. Write a song about it and rock the world. Hey everybody, how's it going? It is Friday, December the 24th. Hope you're going to have an amazing holiday weekend. This is that time of year where we make another orbit around the sun and we call it the solstice and then the Christians hijacked it and turned it into an orgy of hyper-capitalism where we buy useless crap for people we can't stand. So this is truly the most wonderful time of the year. Anyway, this show is about you, not about me. So let's get to your comments and questions right now. Gun! I don't have a treated space for recording. What do you think about recording in a car, vocals, acoustic guitars? I say try it. You know, I've, I've never actually done it myself. An acoustic guitar might be kind of interesting if you can put your seats down and maybe use a short mic stand and put it on your front seat or something like that. The trick is just having enough space. If you're in a, in a van or something like that, you might have a little bit more space. Maybe you've got those fold flat seats, that kind of thing, like I do in my minivan. You might actually be able to get some space in there. I remember I used to work with film crew and I remember talking with one, a few of the guys and they said they do some of the dialogue recording in a car after the shoot. You know, they play everything back and then sync up the vocals and that kind of thing because you get a get much cleaner signal in a car. And it's a great place to mix as well. So there is something to be said for that. I don't know. Have any of you guys out there tried recording anything in your car? My problem with vocals would be you'd have to do it from a sitting position so you might not be able to get all the strength you want. And if you're in the States, I implore you to proceed with caution because if you're going to sit in your car for a couple of hours doing screaming vocals, there's a very good chance one of your neighbors might call 911 and then the cops show up. And in America, the cops shoot first and ask questions rarely. Good! What are your thoughts on recording straight from the FXN on an amp and adding an IR in afterwards? It seems like it would get better results than using cheap mics in a crappy sounding room for us mere mortals. Oh, it probably would. It'd probably get you where you want to go a whole lot faster because learning how to mic a cabinet is an entire experience unto itself. Using an effect send is fine. Just make sure you've got, if it's a tube amp, especially make sure you've got a speaker hooked up to your speaker output or you'll wind up frying your amp. That, all that, that energy those tubes are making needs to have to go somewhere and that means going into a speaker. Uh, the other thing is use a load box like a Two Notes Captor X and you'll be good to go as well. You'll get a better sound if you use the speaker output because the Two Notes is a a reactive load box and it pushes back against the amp the same way a speaker would. So try that, but if you're flat broke and you've just got a cabinet, yeah, try recording out of the effects send into an IR. You're probably gonna be very happy with the results you get. Good luck, man. I love how Glenn says fuck all the time. So much, in fact, that I've unintentionally adopted the way when I say it, because it's so entertaining. Well, George, that's just the product of being on an assembly line for 27 years. That is how we speak when we work for a living. That is the language of the factory floor. So instead of coming across as a snob or, oh, I'm gonna look down my nose at you guys, kind of thing, no, 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 I'm gonna speak to you in the same way I would speak to anybody else who fucking works for a living, because that's what I've done for so very long, and that's what so many of us out there are doing. We're not rock stars. We're the people who fucking cut the lawns and cook the food and collect the garbage and build the houses and run the wiring, all that kind of stuff. You guys are out there busting your asses, doing shit jobs, and a lot of you are doing it for shit wages too. So I'm going to speak to you on the same fucking level because I am one of those people. Hey guys, let me show you something I haven't done in a very long while. Chrome! It's cereal! Now, it's been well documented on the show that I've lost over 65 pounds by doing a keto style of low carb diet. That meant giving up sugar, bread, pasta, french fries, and cereal. And giving up cereal is pretty tough because I freaking love cereal. So when Magic Spoon hit me up and wanted to know if I could do a spot for them, I was like, okay, but send me a box, let me try it out because there is no way in hell I'm recommending this if it tastes like cardboard. And that's the thing, a lot of low carb substitute products are also low in flavor. Well, this stuff showed up yesterday and it took some pretty serious self-discipline to not eat the entire box in one sitting. Finally, I can have cereal again. Magic Spoon is high protein, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, wheat-free, and most importantly, keto-friendly with only four grams of net carbs. 
which means that I can have breakfast again and still fit into my leather jacket and jeans. It comes in frosted, cookies and cream, peanut butter, cinnamon, blueberry, maple waffle, and most importantly, cocoa, which is my childhood favorite. Seriously, I wanna grab a bowl of this stuff and go watch an episode of Robotech. And here's the thing, I know a bunch of you guys got inspired by the videos I've done on my weight loss and are doing the low carb thing too. So if it tasted bad, I would not be putting it on my show. Now, Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that it's backed with a 100% guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link below and use the code SMGLOWCARB for $5 off your next order or go to magicspoon.com slash SMGLOWCARB to save five bucks today. Now back to the show, now I'm gonna finish this bowl. I love how these so-called modern metal bands ragged on you because you conceded about drum sample blending while your sample list drum sounds still trumps whatever preset they've used on GGD or whatever because they didn't even listen carefully. Yeah, it turns out I've been living life on hard mode for the last 20 years, uh, doing sample list drum recordings and making the best fucking drum recordings I possibly can because that's where my passion is. By the way, give me a week or two on the new How to Record Heavy Drum series. We are going to have some more episodes coming up in the near future. I'm just kind of getting over my 30 videos in 30 days for November. So yeah, just bear with me guys, more is coming. That being said, you know, it, it's like dropping a sample on a drum set is like the easiest thing in the universe right now. And there's so many great sample sets out there, uh, the aforementioned GGD, all that kind of thing. In fact, this is the thing, I mean, like as I've been acknowledging, most guys can't afford to be in bands or, you know, they're not gonna be, have the same music musical vision as other band members. Everybody's kind of wants to do their own thing. So I think we're gonna see more and more and more and more of desktop metal production. And that's not necessarily a ba bad thing. Hopefully we're gonna get some really cool artists coming out in the very near future. Now I'm gonna drop the little hint here. I just heard back the very first demo being played back from the very first Spectre Digital Contact Live for all you guys out there who are at their desktops. It uh, sounds pretty freaking realistic at this point. I'm not sure if we're gonna do a thing where everything is completely processed and all you gotta do is throw up the faders and it sounds good or we're gonna do presets or whatnot. But right now it sounds pretty damn close to a real drummer, at least as far as contact libraries go. Gonna be interesting to see what happens over the next few months, and I'm sure a bunch of you guys just went, whoa, what, 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 what what's this? Yeah, um, stay tuned, uh, shit's gonna get interesting this year. Butthurt of the Week talks about new and original. You mean like all the bands with the same Kemper, Podgo, Helix settings and the same drum samples, and vocals who do all do the same tunnel vocals because they can't make the sounds without it? New and original. Yeah, unfortunately that's the case for a lot of people, they just don't wanna show any kind of imagination, but that's not a new phenomenon. I mean, back in the 80s, I knew literally seven different guys from seven different bands and they were all named Easy. And they all had the name copyrighted as well. It was fucking ridiculous. Everybody wanted to be the next Poison or Warrant or something like that and get chicks. That was the thing. So, you know, the copycat thing is definitely not a new phenomenon. I mean, like at the end of the 60s, everybody wanted to be Steppenwolf. In the 90s, everybody wanted to be Pantera. It's just people will follow whatever's popular and try and work off that instead of trying to find their own cool, new and original things. That's just human nature at its finest. Now, this next part wasn't actually a viewer's comment, but I saw this on a public forum somewhere, and I thought I'd share it with you guys because I think it's really important to discuss this. Creativity requires constraints. Otherwise, Parkinson's law will sabotage you. Parkinson's law is the adage that work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. So it is sometimes applied to the growth of bureaucracy in an organization. I think Parkinson's law is a huge factor in modern metal. It's, I went to a seminar there a few years back and you know they were recording this amazing guitar player doing all this amazing riffing. And the first thing they did was got out you know, the, the stretcher and started timelining everything. And it's like, I wanted to scream at them so bad. You're not making it any better, you idiots! They could have left it and it would have been fine. I think that's Parkinson's law in action. You know, the minute we put a grid up on our music where just have an instinct, oh, we need to fuck with this, we need to align it. Well, the Beatles never had a click track. Paul McCartney will say the thing, Ringo might have sped up a little, might have slowed down a little bit, but the band would react to his playing and surge ahead or sur slow down just a little bit. And that was fine. Those recordings have definitely stood the test of time. That's called humanity. And when we have all these extra tools, we have this unconscious desire to suddenly use them, whether we need to or not, and that fucking sucks.
If you can't hear differences between preamp tubes, you're a dumb monkey. If you get some JJ's and then swap them out for molars and can't hear a difference, I don't know what to tell you. You've got boomer ears or something. Well, Mika, I eagerly await the results of your test showing us exactly how you swapped your JJ's out for Mullard and heard the difference. Of course, there's no link in your comment to that test you made because that would require effort and we all know that's the only thing standing in the way between you and worldwide success. Of course, Mika is referencing the tube test video I did about a year ago where I showed, hey, guess what? There's no tone shift going on here. There is an amplitude shift. Sure, we can tell the difference there. One might be louder and one might be quieter. But we've been bullshitted throughout the years. Oh, change your tubes. You're going to hear a massive shift in your tone. No, no, you fucking will not. Some tubes are cleaner. Some tubes are dirtier. Some tubes are louder. Some tubes are quieter. But that's the only thing they're doing is making your amp a little bit louder or a little bit quieter. And some tubes might be a little more reliable than the others. But to think changing your tubes out is going to make one amp brighter or darker, that's absolute fucking horseshit. We fucking proved that we did null tests. All we saw was a change in amplitude. And once you adjust for that amplitude, guess what? No tone shift. The results do not care what your feelings are on the matter or the fact that you might have spent an extra several hundred dollars on a set of tubes that you really didn't need to. If your tubes are functional, then they are the best ones you could possibly get for your amp. Here's the thing, Mika. The only way to refute science is with better science. So get to it. I love that a guy called Glenn a boomer. I'm the same age as Glenn, and anytime I hear someone in our age group being called a boomer, I know the person saying it is a moron from the start. I'd rather listen to Dave Mustaine than having to be forced to listen to his ex-guitar player complain about standing in line, not to mention his enormous ego, and be treated like I'm less of a human being because I'm a cashier he's buying his lighters, chocolate, and batteries from. Every week. It's delightful. Hey, everybody. That's my very good friend, Cindy, who works at a local dollar store. Word has it that a certain ex-member of Megadeth lives in the town of Kingsville, Ontario, and um, apparently, according to him, his shit doesn't stink and he's better than the rest of us. Not gonna mention any names, of course, but when I found out the guy had moved here a couple of years back, I offered to have him come on the show so he could promote his record. And uh, he came back with, well, you can pay me to be on your show. And I'm like, yeah, good luck with that one, Rockstar. Here's the thing, we all know who you are, but we all know who you used to be. Your new guitar tone is coming along nicely. I have a feeling that everyone's going to start rushing to this sound the same way they did with the vintage 30s. Well, thanks very much. I love discovering cool new ways to make awesome metal guitar tones. And you're referencing the one where we're using the Slush and EVH blended with a hemp back with a 57 and the toll mic on it. And yeah, I thought that made a very interesting sound. Can we roll a clip here? Yeah, that definitely doesn't sound anything like a vintage 30, and it's kind of a breath of fresh air, but I fear you may be right that as soon as those speakers become publicly available, that everyone's gonna kind of jump on that and everyone's gonna want to kind of imitate that. And once again, that is just human nature. That's how we're built. It's like, oh, that's neat. Let's all go do that. But the underlying theme here is that, yes, the vintage 30 has been fucking done to death, so try something new. Actually, I've been reached out to you guys there on a shorts a couple weeks ago and asked you guys for your suggestions. Hey, what? What kind of speaker brands do you think I should be checking out? And a lot of you guys left me some cool comments, uh, but you guys mentioned the PV Sheffields. The stupid thing is I had one of those cabinets back in the early 90s and I sold it. Now I'm kind of kicking myself. You know, those might be cool to investigate. There's also some other cool brands out there. And I'm not talking about the big guys. I mean, like I've got tons of WGS. Uh, I've got the new Eminence I need to demo and I want to check out some Jensen's. But if you guys have some suggestions for other speaker brands out there that you might think might be really cool to check out like Weber or somebody like that, let me know in the comments below because I'm definitely going to go exploring this year, I think, and go and try and find cool new guitar speakers that might be a little bit off the beaten track and get us something awesome. Because the Vintage 30, as great as it is, is a little bit overdone and we need to start to show a little bit of imagination. If you're having a hard time playing steady rim shots, lower the snare drum slightly so when you hit your thigh, you will get a perfect rim shot. You'll end up with a few sweet bruises on your thighs after two days of tracking, but who gives a fuck? You'll sound like a metal god. Hey everybody, that's Dave Les who's been on the show a few times over the last couple years. Good friend of the show. Dave's a great drummer. He stepped in and saved the day there for a Witherfall in Mexico uh, a couple weeks back. That was really cool. We're going to have a show on that, an interview with uh, Joseph Michael and explain what happens when you hire a session drummer and then they bail out on you the day before the gig. 
Yeah, that's real fun. Anyway, uh, yeah, Dave's got some great advice there. Yeah, you know what? Suffer for the art. I love that. Anyway, if you're into recording live drums, make sure you check out my series, How to Record Heavy Drums 2. Hopefully it can be some help to you guys. Hey, Glenn, how about an episode on ribbon mics? Probably the coolest thing on guitars and vocals to say nothing about drum overheads. Oh, I love ribbon mics. You know, I've had these sitting around for a while and I've never got around to doing an episode on these. These are the Rode NTRs. I got a pair of these. Uh, they're absolutely wicked on drum room. Really, really cool stuff. Let's see what we got here. Yeah. Oh, is this thing a butte or what? Check that out. That is just freaking cool. It's fucking heavy as shit. Oh, yeah. that That's awesome. Ribbon mics are absolutely amazing. I've got several. Um, I've got a couple Apexes. I've got an art ribbon mic, but I got two of these, and I still really have to do a show on these. They can be a little bit cloudy on a guitar cabinet, but, uh, you know, blended with a 57, they can, they can be really amazing. Yeah, you know, I think I really got to do an episode on ribbon mics and metal. That's definitely going to be something worth checking out. And the great thing is you can get some Chinese-made ribbons, like, say, the Cascade Fatheads, for not a lot of money. And they can definitely open up your sonic palette. Definitely worth investigating. How do you plug all those mics into a computer? Seems like you need an audio interface with 16 inputs with 16 preamps. So which one is good? Ah, uh, you're referencing how I'm recording all my drum stuff, and yes, you definitely need a bigger interface. Now, for the longest time, I started out with a pair of M-Audio Delta 1010s, and I was using uh, a really cheap Alesis mixer for all the preamps, and then you just upgrade over time. You can get a Focusrite Claret or a Scarlet that has eight mic preamps, or you can get two of those and do that, or you can use an eight channel and then eight add in another two channels or four channels, something like that. For right now, I'm using the Focusrite Red 16 line, and that's uh, 16 analog ins and outs. And for preamps, I'm using eight off the Neve 1073 OPX, and then I've got four API 512Cs, and then I've got four more 500 series preamps if I need a total of 16 preamps. That seems to be doing the job pretty damn well. The OPX is worth its weight in gold. It really is. It just sounds magnificent. I absolutely love working with it. And it's like, you know, I'm, I'm in a very fortunate position right now. But remember, it's taken me 20, 25 years to build up this kind of gear collection. So there is that. You might start out small, but the great thing is you don't have to drop a lot of money on preamps these days because even the ones in the in the the entry level Focusrite series are fantastic. If you want something maybe even a little bit better, check out the Audient ASP 800 or the 880. Uh, the Audient preamps are absolutely phenomenal, and um, I was very happy to have one in my rack for a long time. But I gave one up, giving that to one of the biggest fans of the show, um, Chris Canadian Jesus from over on the Discord. He got the ASP 800 to help out with his drum recordings. It's very 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 clean, and it's the exact same preamps that they use in their large format console. Amazing stuff. You can get some gr really great stuff out there, especially if you check the used market too. Some of the earlier Focusrite units, you can check out some of the PreSonus stuff or the Focusrite stuff. As long as it's still got drivers, you should be in good shape. I love your content, but you're too old school sometimes. Sorry, I just grew up in a time where bands performed live off the floor, not to a metronome and not super timeline, and didn't have computers doing the heavy lifting for them. You know, we called that musicianship back in the day. Hey, Glenn, you mentioned reviews all being too positive to be true and the scammy nature of most review media. But could you maybe give a little guide on how to exactly look for real reviews? Or is it just kind of a trial and error thing where you need to take all reviews with a grain of salt? It would be awesome if you did a mic buying or gear buying guide for home studios. I've been researching this stuff and there's too much to know. I feel like if a blueprint for reasonable buying process, it would make things a lot easier. Cheers and thanks for all your awesome videos. All right, actually, that's a really good idea. You know what? I did this video several years ago called the $1,500 Recording Studio. I think I need to update that for modern times. The weakest link in that old chain were the, uh, were the monitors. Uh, those were some really shitty ones from Mackie, and I was not impressed with the, them at all. I've got the Cali LP6 Mark II's rocking back there, and those are, what, $150 a piece? $179 each? I, I forget exactly what the price is. Anyway, you can you can get them. They're very reasonably priced, and they're very, very revealing as to what's going on. So maybe I should update that video, see if we can still do live drums, or maybe do you know the $500 recording studio or the $1,000 recording studio and take the live drums out of the equation and just see what we can get. Actually, that sounds like a video I really do want to make. Thank you so much for the suggestion. As for reviews, uh, yeah, watch them. I mean, like Henning over on HP42 gives very honest reviews, and he's definitely pissed off a few gear manufacturers over time. Like I said, I'll do gear reviews as well. Check, Especially check out my series, Fearless Gear Reviews, because those are completely funded by myself, and you get the straight dope. The, well, one of my more controversial ones was reviewing some of the Clark Technic stuff. They're, they're too BQ because it was an absolute atrocity and a complete and total piece of shit, especially compared against the plugin, emulating the real thing, and definitely against the real thing. It was a terrible fucking piece of equipment. Most people should save their money instead of spending $300 on a bullshit 2BQ that really doesn't do what it's supposed to do. You can spend 50 bucks on a fucking plugin that's going to sound better. This is the thing. If you watch a review and they have absolutely nothing to, 
negative to say whatsoever, then that reviewer is full of shit. Level 11, what about a motorcycle? You can find new bikes for as little as $4,500 and admire decent used bikes for $4,000 or less. If your commute doesn't require highway driving, you don't mind a little DIY. Brand new street legal bikes can be had for as little as $1,500 if you buy it off Amazon. Insurance is dirt cheap, especially if you live in the US. I pay only $100 a year to insure my bike. Okay, old man alert here. here here's the thing, you know, when I was down in LA there a couple years back, I was seriously considering getting a motorcycle because a buddy of mine told me, hey, it's so much easier to get around. You can cut through tr you know, traffic jams. You can get to where you want to go. Here's the thing. When you're driving in your car and you're calling the other people on the road idiots, okay, you're going to bet your life that those idiots can drive well and are aware you are where you are. You know, I've lost a lot of friends on motorcycles over the years, and I've got a very good friend of mine who works at a bike shop. He says, yeah, every summer there's a story at least once a week or every other week where somebody's getting killed or horribly maimed on one of these bikes. I'm not comfortable in betting my life that although I can drive safely, the people around me can drive safely too. That's a bet I'm not willing to make. Your mileage may vary. I live in a big city with very developed public transport, including taxis, so I've never seen a point to own a car, which is very expensive to maintain here. Service centers are full of unskilled workers, permanent traffic jam, yet people around me keep saying I'm insane and definitely need to drive a car in order to be perceived as a full adult. It may sound funny, but it's really a thing of status here. Status, yes. That is the thing in Western culture. The automobile is definitely a piece of status. I mean, like I've definitely taken a look at some much more expensive vehicles uh, to buy, but they're toys, and then I look at it and I think, no, I don't fucking need this. This is just a complete and total waste of money. I'm more than happy with my minivan. And this is the thing. If you can get by without owning a car, then don't buy a car because it's a gigantic waste of money. Status, yeah, status that you fucking drank the Kool-Aid. As soon as you drive your car off the lot, it loses fucking value. It's one of the worst investments you could possibly make. Good for you for saving your money. I've got way more respect for that than somebody who dropped their money on a stupid toy that they don't need. Grubhub, your total is $30.95 for four items from McDonald's. Me. Oh, fuck. That's like half a guitar pedal. Ah, this is all in response to that crushing debt video I did there a couple weeks ago. And it's funny, I was talking on my Discord there with uh, a couple guys, and one guy said, you know, I, I, I watched your video and I stopped ordering Grubhub. Suddenly, I've got money. And it's like, yeah, Grubhub is very convenient. It's also stupidly expensive. And if you've got two functioning hands, make your own fucking meals and save yourself some money. Seriously, you're just throwing money out the garbage when you use services like that. Grubhub and Instacart are just, just, they are going to fucking fleece you. Go to the fucking grocery store, buy your own food and cook your own food. You'll save yourself a fucking fortune. And then suddenly, wow, I could afford gear. Yeah, no fucking shit. Take it from a guy who smoked for 23 years. When I quit, I waited six months and I took all the money that I, I would have spent on cigarettes and I bought myself a vintage U87. And that was like $3,500. And it's like, wow, suddenly I've got money. Suddenly I can afford this shit. Don't be a sucker. Don't throw your money away on stupid useless shit. Lol, love it. This was worth watching just to see Glenn playing emo chords. Either way, that's a really sweet guitar, so thanks for sharing it with us. Dude, what in the fuck are emo chords? I mean, seriously, I'm going to take a wild guess that those chords were around a long time before emo ever became a thing. All right, everybody, that's it for this episode. Thanks so much for watching. And I want to thank our sponsor, Magic Spoon, uh, who came up, finally came up with a product for people like me who used to be fat and we can still enjoy cereal. Believe me, I'm super excited about it. And uh, I'm, I'm super thrilled to have them on the show. And until next time, remember, folks, if you're considering starting a band and you want to put your project out on CD, baby, don't. <laughs> and the cops show up, they shoot. Does that always shoot for me? One, one more time. I've, I've got this. I just got to nail this joke here. Sorry. 80. Oh, what? ASP? Yeah. Well, <laughs> what about a microsol? Microsol? Yeah.